Hey guys, Brent Hall Build Show. Looking forward to sharing part two of the classical system, right? This is the, uh, my little studio I've been putting together. I bought an awesome table saw, I got a band saw, I got a chop saw coming. I'm gonna be making things in here and I'm really excited about this space, right? This is an old 1921 warehouse. I've got this, I built this wall where I can nail moldings up on the wall and actually show you how to do this over the coming weeks and months. But today is part two. Come join me, I've got a ton to share. So this is part two of the classical system. Remember, this is a system for builders because it's about construction. If we just did a recap, remember the power of moldings, the power of doing this. Remember my picture, I've got this projection up in the wall, the little entry hall in this 1960s house that all we did was change the moldings and it totally transformed this space. The other thing is, is that this system is about building, okay? I, I, freak out at this picture, okay, because what's happening is the same thing has been said. The same, you know, message has been given from the builder to the carpenter, build a mantle, right? How come 200 years ago we built this beautiful mantle, well-proportioned, scaled, crafted, and today we can't do that? So we're gonna be getting into why this system works, remembering how to build beautifully. Remember, this is a system about proportion, about scale, about uh, beauty, right? And because it's based on the human scale, we naturally Really understand it. There's three parts of, of this system, and you, and you see I've got the, uh, the Doric order over here uh, in three sizes, eight, nine, and ten foot. And we're going to actually be breaking out that, uh, looking at how to lay out a room today, right? Looking at how moldings work in a room. That'll be the last part of today's video. But we've got three parts. We've got the, the pedestal, we've got the column, and we've got the entablature, okay? Remember, there's three parts of each, right? In the entablature, there's the architrave, okay, which is where door casings and things like that come from. We've got the frieze, and then we've got the cornice. Now, all of these things that we use today are based on this classical system. The, the three parts in the, in the column, we've got the capital and the base and the shaft, and here we've got the surbase, the base and the dado, right? So we've got three different sections of each deal. Three becomes this magical number, but we're gonna dig into this today and we're gonna learn a ton. I really have to start with a history lesson because what we, where we are right now, okay, classicism really falls apart as an architecturally favored system in the 30s and 40s as modernism begins to take over. Uh, the architectural schools and the design schools, Mies van der Rohe, uh, Walter Gropius in the 40s, right? They come from Europe. It really changes the way things are built. So we begin to ignore the classical system in the 40s and 50s, right? And so today we've forgotten how good news is, is that there's been other times in history where we've forgotten this lesson. Now, I'd like to show you this house. This is Chiswick House, okay? This is in England. This is 1720s, okay? William Kent, uh, an English pattern book author, was the architect, okay? Why did he build this house? Not how, okay? Uh, not how much money, right? But why, okay? Well, to really understand this house and why he built it, we really have to look at this building, okay? This is the Pantheon in Rome. This is around 300 AD, right? And they built the Pantheon. This is the Roman building, a beautiful building, right? That's been, that's been revered and studied. Now, remember that during the Renaissance, when they looked at this building, they were amazed. How could these Romans, okay, have built this dome, this freestanding dome without any other kind of structure holding it up? It baffled them. In fact, most of the buildings of that the Greek and Roman era that they looked at, they were amazed by, okay? So one of those guys was under Palladio, okay? He was a stonemason, one of my building heroes because he started out as a craftsman before, before he's called an architect today, but really he was a, a builder craftsman first, okay? He built this house called Villa Rotunda, okay? Now, it is obviously based on the, uh, the Pantheon, that same idea, the pediment front coming out on the top, the dome in the back, right? Very similar to that. Palladio was a learned man, okay? And so he started out as a stonemason. There was a man, Trasino, who kind of took him under his wing. In fact, gave him the name Palladio. He was the one who took uh, Palladio to Rome, okay? He was the one who saw promise in Palladio and said, hey, let's go to Rome because you're gonna freak out when you see these buildings. And over the number next, you know, 30 years, 40 years, Palladio kept going back to Rome. And what he was doing with Rome, he was studying the buildings, okay? Now, 
realize that Rome at this time was, you know, if this is the walls of Rome, the Vatican, okay, the Catholic Church and everything else, because St. Peter was buried outside of the city walls where criminals were buried, they built the Vatican outside the walls of the city, right? So most of the growth in Rome had taken place outside of the city, okay, Vatican City, right? Inside the walls, we have this Campo Vicino, right, which is the cow fields. So the Roman Forum, the most important area of Rome, was actually like this, was in ruins. But what happened was, and there's the Forum today, right, as we, as when I was there a few years ago, and then looking at the Forum, right, still a lot of ruins. What Palladio did was he measured these buildings, okay? He actually studied the proportion and scale. And his book, The Four Books of Architecture, is a lot about how they built in the past. And he discovered, as he was studying these buildings, you know, how they built them, you know, that there was a proportion and scale to the orders, that all the pieces and parts related to one another. Now, remember, this is the Renaissance, right? I told you last time in the last video about Vitruvius, okay? He was the only book that came from the classical period that they were able to find during the Renaissance that we have actually even today was Vitruvius's book on architecture. Palladio would have studied this, he would have understood that there was proportion and scale in the buildings and he would have wanted to understand that. So he actually dug in and studied these buildings. Now the reason Chiswick House was built was because he was looking, uh, William Kent was studying Palladio's book. This book, Palladio's book, changed the way people built, okay, changed the way that they constructed things. In fact, Thomas Jefferson said Palladio was his Bible, right? So Palladio was the book that he had to, had to study. Now remember, okay, when Thomas Jefferson wrote in the 1780s that no one understood proper scale and proportion in architecture. And by 1820, after he's finished with Monticello and uh, the UVA campus, right? He's influenced architecture in that region, right? So that Jeffersonian architecture, right? His influence in architecture was profound, okay? So again, I tell you that because, and there's UVA's campus, all these buildings relate, okay? All these buildings kind of come together and tie together. They all have the same story. We're relearning the past, and that's what we're doing today, it was we're relearning the past, how to build rediscovery of this system of building, and it's awesome. Let's just study the orders, right? Okay, we've got the, the we're, remember, we're studying the three orders, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, right? Um, what I've done is I've printed out full scale the order, okay? I've done it at an eight foot height, I've done it at a nine foot height, I've done it at a 10 foot height, okay? Now, there are things that we should actually learn from, from this thing, and you know, we can just take a tape measure and just begin to study these things, right? Begin to look at them. One thing I want you to notice is that the moldings, even though this is the same, you know, order, right? As it grows in size, the moldings change, okay? So, um, this is the architrave. Remember, this is the entablature. This is the beam that's supported by the columns, right? The architrave here, which ends up influencing the size of our door and window casings, okay? This one is three and five eighths, okay? This one, remember, same order, we've grown about a foot in height of the room. And remember, this is just like the human body. Small bodies have small things, big bodies have big things, right? So as it grows, naturally all the parts and pieces grow with it. Uh, this one's four and three sixteenths, and this one is four and you know five eighths. Notice too, the height of the chair rail changes. This one's at 20, this one's at 22, this one's at 24, 25, right? And so the the, all the parts and pieces change, okay? And, you know, in big rooms need bigger moldings, small rooms need smaller moldings, okay? Now, the other thing about this you'll notice on the column is, is what's called entesis, okay? Now, entesis is the fact that the column's shaft gr uh, shrinks as it gets taller. I always, I always look at it like a tree, right? That, the, that a tree trunk doesn't stay all the way up and then you have all these branches at the top, right? It actually grows more slender and then splits later, right? But the, just like a tree trunk, this one's at seven and a half, let's say at the base. At the top, it is, you know, six and a quarter, right? Okay, and so good columns have this, what's called entesis, where they, 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 they get slender at the top versus the bottom. So if we look at, right, the columns, right, notice that 
as it's broken out, remember that all the parts and pieces relate, okay? They all relate to D, okay? Remember it says 1D right here, okay? This is 5-6-D, right? There's, there's the order as it, as it shrinks. Notice that all these parts and pieces are related to D. It says 1 half D, it says 7-D, right? Even on the ionic order, right, we have the same thing. We have the, we have the column and then it's shrinking down. So entesis is something that happens in all these columns. The other thing that happens is that there's a relationship between the column and the beam and the entablature above it, right? And you'll see it in this breakout right here that the, uh, the column, the, the neck of the column lines up with the beam of the entablature. Same thing on the Corinthian order, that R, this little dotted line goes down to the neck of the column, right? Same thing here, you're seeing that this neck line right here lines up with this beam. Now, part of the perfection of this system is that there is this relationship, right? That they looked at these things for so long, they looked and built these buildings so carefully that they found better ways of doing it. So when we build silly things and don't do it right, right? It doesn't look right because they've perfected it, right? So there's no point in reinventing it. We see the same thing. This is the Doric order, right? You see the triglyphs right here above, okay? Unfortunately, okay, we've kind of forgotten how to do this. And the problem with these pictures, right? The problem with what's going on here is A, the columns don't have emphasis, right? This is just a straight tube all the way up. Notice that the relationship of the capital, which is right in here, uh, versus the column is, is the proportions are kind of messed up, right? There's no entablature here, right? They come up right to the ceiling of the porch. There's nothing, there's no beam here, okay? And the whole roof overhangs the column, okay? Same thing here in this bank is this whole roof uh, overhangs here. And then there's their entablature, kind of funky, right? But the, the parts and pieces are there, but because they're not put together right, they don't make sense. Here too in some residential examples, right? Where you see this front porch and they actually have an entablature over here, but the columns, this beam is too thick, okay? For that column, it should be the size, the neck of that column, right? So it begins to look funny, right? Their entablature actually isn't terrible. This Corinthian column, one on the inside, thrown up right against the ceiling, small entablature. Some of the things are right there, but Realize, guys, that it's getting the parts and pieces right, getting all these different things, following the rules of class, this classical system, right, will help you build better. Now, one of the last things is the dental, okay? The dental, okay, is right in here. And you can see from this example where they've got these big old honking teeth dental coming down there, right? One of the things we mess up more than just like the columns and the beam relationship, we also mess up dentals. They end up down here, they end up too big, right? Always, if we look at our entablature, right? Architrave, frieze, cornice, the bed mold, the bottom part, okay? There's three parts of the, uh, of the cornice. Bed mold, corona, cymation, okay? Top crown, corona is that flat piece, bed mold. The dental is always split between the, between the bed mold, right? and that's where the dental goes. And there's a proportional relationship, as you see here, right? All these different parts and pieces relating to D, okay? That there is a relationship between the size of those and this. Now, what that means is, is that you can't go to a lumber yard and buy dental, okay? Or you, it's not easy to do. We end up making our own because they're just, they're just not available off the shelf. So when you do end up taking a one by four or one by six and cutting teeth out of it, right? You're not building dentals right, right? You're introducing things that can make your work look unsophisticated, right? Uh, unlearned, right? You're just practicing things that a country builder would do. So remember, right? There are just a few things that if you watch this video and do, you know, two things, right? Three things. <laughs> Stop making big, ugly dentals, right? You know where they belong. They belong in, they belong in the bed mold, right? And there's a relationship, a size relationship related to those. They're, they're thicker and bigger than just uh, cutting a one by four or one by two or whatever you're gonna do there. Get the dental right, put it in the right place, okay? Get the columns with emphasis. Don't get straight shafts, right? That that emphasis starts a third of the way up the column and then it slowly tapers in, right? Get the beam right. Get, and here's a, 
uh, a Doric capital, right? Notice that my beam is here, okay? My beam is sitting out and I measured this capital and kind of where it is in the neck. It sits right there. So you're going to have overhang. And sometimes what we hear from clients is, well, I don't like that overhang or I don't want that thing sticking out. Tough, okay? That's, that's where it belongs. That's why it's going to make it look right. And so, guys, it's taken me 10 years to figure all this stuff out, right? It's taken me a long time to figure out how these parts and pieces go together. But what I, what I reason I get excited about and reason I think it's important is because I've done it the wrong way and then I understand the rules and I start to do it the right way and my work is transformed, right? It is better work. It's more beautiful work when you copy the past. It's like if you're going to you know, build, uh, make cordon bleu, right? There's a lot of ways you can do it, okay? But there is a French tradition and a French way of doing it with the butter and the, the right ways of doing it. And it just tastes better, right? Because you're following a tradition, okay? So same thing is true with architecture. You need to understand these traditions so you can start using them for better work. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to talk about, because I'm going to be making a bunch of videos on historic interiors, Georgian, Federal, Greek Revival, Period Revival, Victorian, all these things. That's why I built this wall. That's why I'm putting all this together, right? How do you lay out a room? The, probably the, the, the question I get more than anything, okay, from homeowners and craftsmen and everybody else is, how high should my chair rail be? Um, what size should my moldings be? What about crowns? Okay, so remember that, that, that in this system, right, everything that we do, all the moldings that we use today are based on the, this, the way this is laid out, right? And so our base relationship of the base, the chair rail, the picture rail, okay? The picture rail is the tania, which is the top part of the, of the architrave, of the, uh, is where that lays out. Now, our picture mold, right, and you'll see it in Victorian rooms where the picture mold will hang down from the ceiling this far, okay? And you'll see it in bungalows where it only hangs down this far, right? What's going on there, right? It's a proportional tool that's used up and down in these rooms, right? And the crown and the cornice, right? When I designed the moldings for Kukin and Windsor, right, Windsor 1, those guys get it. They understand kind of why, you, why these things need to go this way. And the reason we created a four-part crown like this is because that's based on the classical system. We'll get into that. Now, when we lay out a room, okay, and again, remember, guys, that all this comes from the ICAA, or a lot of it. There's, a, there's some great books I recommended in my last video as far as understanding the classical system, right? But most of the stuff that you're reading right here is ICAA stuff. It's a group you need to join, you need to understand how this works, right? But all of these, either whether in the Doric, Ionic, or Corinthian, okay, they break out the room in five parts. See this, five parts, five parts, five parts, okay? So let's break out a room. Let's, let's lay out a room of how it, how it goes, right? And so you'll see that this is the Corinthian order, one, two, three, four, five. That upper fifth section is your entablature, okay? Same thing here, same thing here, okay? It's it broken into five parts. So we're gonna use that system to, to break, a, break in and look at these rooms and how, to, and how to lay it out. We're gonna lay out the system really quick. We've talked about the five parts, right? And establishing the height of your entablature. We're gonna show you one trick as we wrap up this video because we're gonna dive into this a lot more in future videos. But I just wanna show you how it lays out in a room. Now, people will call me and say, you know, what size should my moldings be? How should all this work? I, uh, I'm going to show you why the classical system doesn't really work for eight foot buildings, okay? Eight foot rooms, okay? Because it was never designed for an eight foot room. And the eight foot room is a product of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, maybe even in the 70s, right? My house is a six, eight foot room, it's 1962, right? It just doesn't work. So I'll show you why. Now, this is eight foot, right? I've, I've drawn that system there. There's eight foot tall, right? Six, eight doors right here. Okay, I've already pre-measured that. Right, there's your door down here. Your door casing is right there. Now, we know the size of that because we've measured off our system right here and it's about three and five eighths, okay? So the door casing is three and five eighths, right? Now, we've got our door, door casing and there's only about 11 inches left. But we know the full entablature is about 15 inches, right? In other words, there's no room to wrap this room with an entablature. It would feel incredibly heavy. It feels like there's too much going on in here. The scale of that room doesn't allow you to use this system, okay? So 
in an eight foot room, I typically am only doing the crown, okay? Maybe in a dining room, we'd do two parts, but typically I am, right, only doing a crown and might maybe do a base underneath it if, if, it, if, I, if I wanted to do just a little bead or something underneath it, right? Maybe bring it down four inches, right? I'm not coming down very far, right? If I wanted to highlight an opening that was very important, I might tie the casing and the, and the crown together, right? But it'd have to be an important opening. So that's the reason it doesn't work. Now, what I'll do real quick is I'm gonna grab this 10 foot ceiling, nine foot ceiling, and talk about how these moldings should work and how it should come together. Let's say you've got a 10 foot room, okay? The first thing you do when you're laying it out is you're measuring, you know, the height of the room, figuring out how tall it is. Let's assume it's 10 feet, which is, you know, right there, right in line with this 10 foot system I built, okay? To divide it into fives, okay, remember it's divided into five parts, we know that our entablature should be two feet. Well, it's not, it's 18 inches, why? Because what we've done is we've introduced a pedestal, okay? So now that my pedestal is here, this is the two foot section, right? So the five parts, this is two foot. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure five parts, I'm gonna dry, divide this back into five parts. And so I should be right at, right at eight feet, right? And a fifth of eight is 19 inches. So. What they've done is, is when they introduced the pedestal, if this column went right down to the ground and there was no pedestal, there's no chair rail, there's no wainscot in the room, then our entablature would actually get bigger, okay? It would be two feet. It would come down the wall two feet. Now that's pretty far down the wall, right? That's right there. That's two feet. That's a honking crown, right? That is, the, that is a big entablature to wrap the room. So you're kind of managing it by the feel, right? how elaborate the, the home is, how high style the room is. You know, you're trying to figure that stuff out. So you're gonna actually lay this out now with the chair rail at two feet. Notice my crown and my cornice comes down about five or six inches. So my crown in a 10 foot room, right, is only coming down from this point. There's, a, there's the three parts. And then there's a bed mold. Right, so this is my cornice. This is my cyma. This is my corona. This is my bed mold, right? You're familiar with that term bed mold, right? So, and this is where the dental would go, right? Between those two moldings. That's only five or six inches. So if you're buying a four and a half or four and a quarter crown, right? You're probably buying a crown that's too big for that room, right? Because this crown is only about two and a half inches, right? So even though the whole thing is, is six, right? It's a smaller molding. So I want you to get used to and understand the scale and the sizings of these moldings, right? So that you can build prettier rooms. Don't put a big four and a half inch crown in there because it's probably too big. Break it up into more sections. It's gonna look prettier. So we've got our chair rail, and I know you guys are screaming and going, yeah, but the chair rail at two foot, I can't put a wainscot in there, it's two foot. Yes, you can, okay? I'm usually telling people that my chair rail is between 28 and 32 inches. Realize that as the pattern book authors of the, of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, were putting things together, the chair rail was moving for them as well, okay? And it should move and organize the room. So the height of your windowsill should be lined up with the chair rail. That's kind of a kind of a standard in this in the system in traditional houses is that the wainscot will line up here. That means your windows are going to come down to around 30 inches. They're not going to be up high. This tool, this molding should unify this space. One of my favorite moldings to use is the chair rail because I feel like it wraps and unifies the space at a height that I can really understand it. If we go back to that eight foot room and you and you start talking about, I mean this chair rail is 20 inches tall, right? And I know you guys are, the three foot guys are screaming out there that the chair rail has to be three feet. But if my ceiling's only this far high and I come up three feet right in here, I'm really messing with the proportions. Now, there's an idea that we're gonna study later called punctuation, which is a mathematical ratio of one to five, one to six, one to seven, right? 
This is punctuating the wall, okay? And if you bring it up this high, you're almost dividing the wall in half, right? Another foot you'd be dividing it in half. You don't get the same scale and proportion that way. All right, too much stuff going on. Too many things to learn. Awesome stuff. This is part two, okay? We'll have a part three. <laughs> Maybe you have to do a part four because there's so many things. We'll start laying out rooms based on this, this system. We'll start looking at historical precedent uh, to understand this better. Now listen, if you want to see more of this stuff, if you want to see how we're prepping and doing stuff, you really should follow me on Instagram, Paul Millward, Paul Holmes. Be sure to follow me there because you'll see a lot of the inside stuff between these videos of what we're doing. Number two, um, I want to thank my sponsors, Cucum Lumber, Windsor One, uh, Chasworth Columns, Decorator Supply. These guys really get and understand the classical system. You ought to buy from them because they're gonna be, you're gonna be able to have conversations with them about chair rail and molding sizes and everything else that makes sense. I'm Brent Hull, thanks for watching me. See you next time.